and, uh, and discover something about each other. It might surprise me or might amaze you. Because <laughs> some of your questions can be very penetrating. Uh, I think it would be nice if I move this nearer to the front so I can see it as well. Now, when Charles Dickens, which is what this little session is about, when Charles Dickens wrote his books, many, many times he was accused of being preposterous and uh, being unrealistic in that the ending of his books were, was, a, was a happy ending, unlike, unfortunately, life. Now, the reason he did this was because, as a great creative artist, and as a good man, I think, he, the characters that he created, he couldn't bear to part from. He wrote very few uh, really vicious characters. And so as the story unfolded, he couldn't bear for people not to be happy. Uh, and so he grew to love his characters, and they became his friends. Now, when I was playing uh, Doctor Who, being playing a character which had a big influence on my whole life, a character who had two hearts and was generous and 700 years old, and in some ways experienced and brave, predictably brave and loyal and good and not materialistic and not violent. As this character overtook me, because you know we are all overtaken by the great pleasures of our lives, I began to feel towards the audience therefore towards the fans who sustained me as I ricocheted around the studios and on the film, on the filming side. I began to sustain by the fans. And I, rather like Charles Dickens, became fond of my fans. They sustained me. We lived in this kind of mutual balance where their approval became very important to me so that I wouldn't do anything uh, deliberately or carelessly that would scandalize the people who were enjoying this kind of adventure that I was living. So rather like Charles Dickens, I also became protective of my fans, especially the very young ones. Uh, later, I became very protective of the very old ones. <laughs> but that came with experience. So, I'm now going to read you a little story uh, which is about redemption. That is, it ends happily. I think it's terribly important in our lives, isn't it, that we all hope, hope sustains us, that we can change, that things can get better, that there won't be a war, that people won't be unhappy. Well, here's a little tale to my life. Dickens used to keep horror at bay by laughing at it. He controlled horror by laughter. His amazing imagination would distort and refract reality to the point of frightening us or saddening us. But constantly it was the contagion of laughter which controlled the horror, which we all know something about. Right. Marley was dead to begin with. There was no doubt whatever about that. The register of his burial was signed by the clergyman, the clerk, the undertaker, and the chief mourner. Scrooge signed it. And Scrooge's name was good upon change for anything he chose to put his hand to. Old Barley was as dead as a doornail. Scrooge knew he was dead? Of course he did. How could it be otherwise? Scrooge and he were partners for I don't know how many years. Scrooge was his sole executor, his sole administrator, his sole assign, his sole residual legatee, his sole friend, his sole mourner. <coughs> Scrooge never painted out of old Marley's name, however. There he had stood years afterwards above the warehouse door. Scrooge and Marley, the firm's known, Scrooge and Marley. Sometimes, People new to the business called Scrooge Scrooge, and sometimes Marley, he answered to both names. It was all the same to him. Oh, but he was a tight-fisted hand at the grindstone, was Scrooge. A squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner. Nobody ever stopped him in the street to say, with glass and looks, my dear Scrooge, how are you? Ha, when will you come see me? No beggars implored him to bestow a title. No 
children asked him what it was at clock. No man, all woman, ever once in all his life inquired the way to such and such a place of Scrooge. Even the blind men's dogs appeared to know him. And when they saw him coming on, would tug their owners into doorways and up courts. And then would wag their tails as though they said, no eye at all is better than the evil eye, dark master. And what did Scrooge care? Eh? Once upon a time, of all the good days in the year, upon Christmas Eve, old Scrooge sat busy in his counting house. It was cold, bleak, biting, foggy weather, and the city clocks had only just gone three, but it was quite dark already. The door of Scrooge's counting house was open, that he might keep his eye upon his clerk, who, in a dismal little cell beyond, a sort of tank, was copying letters. Scrooge had a very small fire, but the clerk's fire was so very much smaller that it looked like one coal, but he couldn't replenish it, for Scrooge kept the coal box in his own room. Wherefore, the clerk put on his white comforter and tried to warm himself at the candle, in which effort, not being a man of very strong imagination, he failed. A Merry Christmas, Uncle, God save you. It was the voice of Scrooge's nephew, Fred, who came upon it so quickly that this was the first intimation Scrooge had of his approach. Bah, said Scrooge, humbug. Humbug? Christmas, a humbug, Uncle, you don't mean that, I'm sure. I do. Out upon Merry Christmas. What's Christmas time for you? A time for paying bills without money, a time for finding yourself a year older, another an hour richer. If I had my will, every idiot who goes about with Merry Christmas on his lips should be boiled with his own pudding and buried with a stake of holly through his heart, he should. Ah, Uncle Nephew, keep Christmas in your own way and let me keep it in mine. Keep it? But you don't keep it. Let me leave it alone then. Much good may it do you. Much good has it ever done you. Ah. And Fred said, well, there are many things by which I might have derived the world from which I haven't profited. I dare say Christmas among the rest, but I'm sure I've always thought of Christmas time when it's come round as a good time. A kind, forbidden, <coughs> charitable, pleasant time. The only time I know of in the long calendar of the year when men and women seem by one consent to open their shut-up hearts freely. And therefore, Uncle, although it's never put a scrap of gold or silver in my pocket, I believe it has done me good and will do me good. And I say, God bless it. <laughs> the clerk in the tank in front of me, Let me hear another sound from you, said Scrooge. And you'll keep your Christmas by losing your situation. Ah, you're quite a powerful speaker, sir, the friend. I wonder you can't go into Parliament. Don't be angry, Uncle, said Fred. Come, dine with us tomorrow. Scrooge said we would see him, yes, indeed. And the whole length of that expression of said he would see him at that extremity first. Said Fred, but why? Why? Why did you get married? Because I fell in love. Because you fell in love. Ha! Growled Scrooge, as if that were the only one thing in the world more ridiculous than a Merry Christmas. Good afternoon. Nay, Uncle, but you never, you never came to see me before that happened. Why do you have a brief for coming now? Good afternoon. I want nothing from you. I ask nothing of you. Why can't we be friends? Good afternoon. And Fred said, I'm sorry with all my heart to find you so resolute. We've never had any quarrel to which I have been a party, but I've made the, tr I've made the trial in homage to Christmas, and I'll keep my Christmas humor to the last. So, a Merry Christmas, Uncle. Good afternoon. And a happy new year. Good afternoon. His nephew left the room without an angry word notwithstanding. And the clerk, in letting Scrooge's nephew out, had let two other people in. They were portly gentlemen, pleasant to behold, and now stood with their hats off in Scrooge's office. They had books and papers in their hands, and they bowed to him. Scrooge and Barney, I believe said one of the gentlemen, referring to his list. Have I the pleasure of addressing Mr. Scrooge or Mr. Marley? <coughs> Mr. Marley has been dead these seven years. He died seven years ago. It's very bad. At this festive season of the year, Mr. Scrooge, said the gentleman, taking up a pen, 
It is more than usually desirable that we should make some slight provision for the poor and destitute who suffer greatly at the present time. Many thousands are in want of common necessaries, sir. Hundreds of thousands are in want of common comforts. Are there no prisons? Well, plenty of prisons. But under the impression that they scarcely furnish Christian cheer of mind or body to the unoffending multitude, a few of us are endeavouring to raise a fund to buy the poor some meat and drink and means of warmth. What shall I put you down for? Nothing. Ah, you wish to be anonymous. I wish to be left alone. Since you ask me what I wish, gentlemen, that is my answer. I don't make merry myself at Christmas, and I can't afford to make idle people merry. I have to support the prisons and the workhouses. They cost enough, and those who are badly off must go there. Many can't go there, and many would rather die. If they would rather die, then they must do it and decrease the surplus population. <clears throat> at length, the hour of shutting up the counting house arrived, and with an ill will, Scrooge, dismounting from his stool, tacitly admitted the fact to the expectant clerk in the tank, who instantly snuffed out his candle and put on his hat. Scrooge said, You'll want the whole day tomorrow, I suppose. It's quite convenient, sir. It's not convenient, and it's not fair. If I was to stop half a crown for it, you'd think yourself mightily ill used, I'd be bound? Yes, sir. And yet, you don't think me ill used, and I pay a day's wages for no work. It's only once a year, sir. A poor excuse for picking a man's pocket every 25th of December. But I suppose you must have the whole day. Be here all the earlier the next morning. The clerk promised that he would. And Scrooge walked out with a growl. The office was closed in a twinkling, and the clerk, with the long ends of his white comforter dangling below his waist, for he boasted no great coat, went down the side at the end of a lane of boys twenty times in honor of its being Christmas Eve, and then ran home as hard as he could coat to play a blind man's buff. Scrooge took his melancholy dinner in his usual melancholy tavern, and having read all the papers and begun the rest of the evening with his banker's book, went home to bed. He lived in chambers which had once belonged to his deceased partner. They were a gloomy suite of rooms in a lowering pile of building up a yard. The building was old enough now and dreary enough. For nobody lived in it but Scrooge, the other rooms being all laid out as offices. Now, it is a fact that there was nothing at all particular about the knocker on the door of this house except that it was very large. Also, that Scrooge had seen it night and morning during his whole residence there. Also, that Scrooge had as little of what is called fancy about him as any man in the city of London. And yet Scrooge, having his key in the lock of the door, saw in the knocker without its undergoing any intermediate process of change. Not a knocker, but Marley's face. Marley's face with a dismal light about it like a bad lobster in a dark cellar. It wasn't angry or ferocious, but it looked at Scrooge as Marley used to look, with ghostly spectacles turned up upon its ghostly forehead. And as Scrooge looked fixedly at this phenomenon, it was a knocker again, and he said, pooh, pooh, and closed the door with a bang. The sound resounded through the house like thunder. Every room above and every cask in the wine merchant's cellar below appeared to have a separate peal of echoes of its own. Scrooge was not a man to be frightened by echoes. He fastened the door and walked across the hall and up the stairs, slowly too, trimming his candle as he went. Up Scrooge went, not caring a button that it was very dark. Darkness is cheap, and Scrooge liked. But before he shut his heavy door, he walked through his rooms to see that all was right. He had just enough recollection of the face to desire to do that. Sitting room, bedroom, number room, all as they should be. Nobody out of the table, nobody out of the sofa, a small fire in the grate, spoon and basin ready, and a little saucepan of gruel upon the hob. Nobody out of the bed, nobody in the closet, nobody in his dressing gown, which was hanging up in a suspicious attitude against the wall. Quite satisfied, he closed his door and locked himself in, double locked himself in, which was not his custom. And thus secured against surprise, he took off his cravat 
put on his dressing gown and slippers and his night cap and sat down before a very low fire to take his gruel. As he threw his head back in the chair, his glance happened to rest upon a bell, a disused bell that hung in the room and communicated for some purpose now forgotten with a chamber in the very highest story of the building. It was with great astonishment and a strange, inexplicable feeling of dread that as he looked, he saw this bell begin to swing. Soon it rang out loudly as did every bell in the house. This was succeeded by a clanking noise deep down below as if some person were dragging a heavy chain over the casks in the wine merchant's cellar. Then he heard the noise much louder on the floors below. Then coming up the stairs, then coming straight towards his door, it came on through the heavy door. And a spectre passed into the room before his very eyes. And upon his coming in, the dying flame leaped up as though it cried, I know him, it's Marley's ghost. The same face, the very same. Marley in his pigtail, usual waistcoat, tights and boots. His body was transparent, so that Scrooge, observing him and looking through his waistcoat, could see the two buttons on the coat behind. Scrooge had often heard it said that Marley had no bowels. <laughs> but he never believed this until now. No, nor did he believe it even now. Though he looked the phantom through and through and saw it standing before him. Though he felt the chilling influence of its death cold eyes and noticed the very texture of the folded kerchief bound above its head and chin, he was still incredulous. Ah, now, what do you want with me? Much. Oh, oh his voice. No doubt about it. Who are you? Ask me who I was. Who were you then? In life, I was your partner, Jacob Marley. Can you, can you sit down? I can do it then. Scrooge asked this question because he didn't know whether a ghost so transparent might find himself in a condition to take a chair. But the ghost sat down on the opposite side of the fireplace as if he were quite used to it. You don't believe in me. I don't. What evidence would you have of my reality beyond that of your senses? I don't know. Why do you doubt your senses? Scrooge said. <laughs> because a little thing affects them. A slight disorder in the stomach makes them cheese. You might be an undigested bit of beef, a blot of mustard, a crumb of cheese, a fragment of an underdone potato. There's more of gravy than a grave about you, whatever you are. <laughs> Scrooge was not much in the habit of cracking jokes. Nor did he feel in his heart by any means waggish then. The truth is that he tried to be smart as a, as a means of distracting his own attention and keeping down his heart. But how much greater was his horror when the phantom, taking off the bandage round its head as if it were too hot to wear indoors, its lower jaw dropped down upon its chest. Mercy, dreadful apparition, why do you trouble me? Why do spirits walk the earth and why do they come to me? The spirit said, It is required of every man that the spirit within him should walk abroad among his fellow men and travel far and wide. And if that spirit goes not forth in life, it is condemned to do so after death. I cannot tell you all I know. A very little more is permitted to me. I cannot rest. I cannot stay. I cannot linger anywhere. My spirit never walked beyond our counting house. Mark me. In life, my spirit never roved beyond the narrow limits of our money-changing hole. And weary journeys lie before me. Scrooge said. Seven years dead, and traveling all the time. You travel fast. On the wings of the wind. Oh. You might have gone over a great quantity of ground in seven years. Oh, blind man, blind man. Not to know that the Christian spirit working kindly in its little sphere, whatever it may be, will find its mortal life too short for its vast things of usefulness. Yet I was like this man. 
succeeding here. Yeah, my time is nearly done. I will, but don't be hard upon me. Don't be foully, Jacob. Pray. I am here tonight to warn you that you have yet a chance and hope of escaping my fate. A chance and hope of my procuring Ebenezer. You were always a good friend to me. Thank you. You will be haunted by three spirits. <laughs> you have a chance and hope you mentioned, Jacob. I, 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 I think I'd rather not. <laughs> Without their visits, you cannot hope to shun the path I tread. Expect the first tomorrow night when the bell tolls one. Expect the second on the next night at the same hour and the third upon the next night when the last stroke of twelve has ceased to vibrate. Look to see me no more and look that for your own sake you remember what has passed between us. It walked backwards from him and in every step it took the window raised itself a little so that when the apparition reached it it was wide open, and it floated out through the self-opened window into the bleak, dark night. Scrooge closed the window and examined the door by which the ghost had entered. It was double locked as he had locked it with his own hand, and the bolts were undisturbed. Scrooge tried to say humbug, but was stuck upon the first syllable. And being from the emotion he had undergone or the fatigues of the day, much in need of repose, he went straight to bed without undressing and fell asleep on the instant. The first of three spirits. When Scrooge awoke, it was so dark that looking out of bed, he could scarcely distinguish the transparent window from the opaque walls of his chamber until suddenly the church clock told a deep, dull, hollow, melancholy one. Light flashed upon the room in the instant and the curtains of his bed were drawn by a strange figure, like a child, yet not so like a child as like an old man viewed through some supernatural medium, which gave him the appearance of having receded from view and being diminished to a child's proportions. Its hair, which hung about his neck and down its back, was white as if with age, and yet the face had not a wrinkle on it, and the tenderest bloom was on the skin. It held a branch of fresh green holly in its hand, and in singular contradiction to that wintry emblem, had its dress trimmed with summer flowers. But the strangest thing about it was that from the crown of its head there sprung a bright, clear jet of light by which all this was visible. Scrooge said, Are you the spirit whose coming was foretold to me? I am. Who and what are you? I am the ghost of Christmas past. Long past? No, your past. The things that you will see with me are shadows of the things that have been. They will have no consciousness of us. Rise and walk with me. It would have been in vain for Scrooge to plead that the weather and the hour were not adapted to pedestrian purposes and bed was warm on the thermometer a long way below freezing that he was clad but likely in his slippers dressing gown and nightcap, and that he had a coat upon him at that time. The grasp, though gentle as a woman's hand, was not to be resisted. He rose, but finding the spirit made towards the window, clasped its robe in supplication, I am awful and liable to fall. There, by the touch of my hand, said the spirit, laying it upon his heart, and you shall be upheld in more than this. As the words were spoken, they passed through the wall and stood in a busy thoroughfare of a city. It was made plain enough by the dressing of the shops that here too it was Christmas time. The ghost stopped at a certain warehouse door and asked Scrooge if he knew it. Knew it? I was apprenticed here, said Scrooge. They went in at the sight of an old gentleman in a Welsh wig sitting behind a, such a high desk but if he had been two inches taller, he must have knocked his head against the ceiling. Scrooge cried out in great excitement, Why, it's your old fishing wig. Bless his heart, it's Fezziwig, alive again. Old Fezziwig laid down his pen and looked up at the clock which pointed to the hour of seven. He rubbed his hands, adjusted his capacious waistcoat, laughed all over from his shoes to his organ of benevolence, and called. 
called out in a comfortable, oily, rich, fat, jovial voice, You over there, Ebenezer, Dick! A living and moving picture of Scrooge himself as a young man came briskly in, accompanied by his fellow princes. Dick Wilkins, to be sure, said Scrooge the ghost. My old fellow princess, bless me, yes, it is. He was very much attached to me with poor Dick, dear, dear. Yo ho, said Fezziwig. No more work tonight, Christmas Eve, Dick. Christmas Eve, Ebenezer. Let's have the shutters up before a man can say Jack Robinson. Clear away, my lads, and let's have lots of room here. Yeah. Clear away. Oh. There was nothing they wouldn't have cleared away or couldn't have cleared away with old Fezziwig looking on. It was done in a minute. Every movable was packed off as if it were dismissed from public life forevermore. The floor was swept and watered, the lamps were trimmed, fuel was heaped upon the fire, and the warehouse was as snug and warm and dry and bright a ballroom as you could desire to see upon a winter's night. In came a fiddler with a music book and went up to the lofty desk and made an orchestra of it and tuned like 50 stomach aches. In came Mrs. Facing Wig. One vast, substantial smile. In came the three Miss Fezziwigs, beaming and lovable. In came the six young followers whose hearts they broke. In came the young men and women employed in the business. In came the housemaid with her cousin the baker. In came the cook with his brother's particular friend the milkman. In they all came, one after another, some shyly, some boldly, some gracefully and some awkwardly. Some pushing and some pulling. In they all came, Anyhow and everyhow. Away they all went. Twenty couples at once, hands half around and back again the other way. Down the middle and up again, round and round in various stages of affectionate grouping. Old top couple always turning up in the wrong place. New top couple starting off again as soon as they got there. All top couples at last and not a bottom one to help them. And when this result was brought about, Old Fezziwig, clapping his hands to stop the dance, cried, Well done! And the fiddler plunged his hot face into a pot of porter, especially provided for that purpose. Ah. There were more dances, and there were forfeits, and more dances. And there was cake, and there was negus, and there was a great piece of cold roast, and there was a great piece of cold boiled. And there were mince pies, and plenty of beer. But the great effect of the evening came after the roast and boil, when the fiddler struck up the Sir Roger de Coverley. Then old Fezziwig stood out to dance with Mrs. Fezziwig. Top couple two with a good stiff piece of work cut out for them. Three or four and twenty pairs of partners, people who are not to be trifled with, people who would dance and had no notion of walking. But if they had been twice as many, four times, Old Fezziwig would have been a match for them, and so would Mrs. Fezziwig. As to her, she was worthy to be his partner in every sense of the term. A positive light appeared to issue from Fezziwig's calves. They shone in every part of the dance. You couldn't have predicted at any given time what would become of them next. And when old Fezziwig and Mrs. Fezziwig had gone all through the dance, advance and retire, turn your partner, bow and curtsy, corkscrew, thread the needle, and back again to your place, Fezziwig cut, cut so deftly that he appeared to wink with his legs. When the clock struck eleven, this domestic ball broke up, and Mr. and Mrs. Fezziwig took their stations, one on either side of the door, and shaking hands with every person individually as he or she went out, wished him or her a Merry Christmas. Scrooge felt the spirits glance on him. And the ghost said, what's the matter? And Scrooge said, now, I should like to be able to say a word or two to my clerk just now. That's all. Oh, spirit, remove me from this place. Remove me. I cannot bear it. Leave me. Take me back and haunt me no longer. As he struggled with the spirit, he was conscious of being exhausted and overcome by an irresistible drowsiness. And further, being in his own bedroom, he had barely time to reel to bed before he sank into a heavy sleep. The second spirit. Scrooge awoke in his own bedroom, there was no doubt about that, but it and his own adjoining sitting room into which he had shot.
shuffling his slippers, attracted by a great light there, had undergone a surprising transformation. The walls and ceilings were so hung with living green that it looked a perfect grove. The leaves of holly, mistletoe, and ivory reflected back the light as if so many little mirrors had been scattered there. And such a mighty blaze went roaring up the chimney as that petrifaction of a hearth had never known in Scrooge's time. Deeped upon the floor to form a kind of throat where turkeys, geese, game, brawn, great joints of meat, sucking pigs, long reeds of sausages, mince pies, plum puddings, cherry cheeked apples, juicy oranges, luscious pears, immense twelfth cakes, and great bowls of punch. In easy state, upon a couch, there sat a giant, glorious to see, who bore a glowing torch in shape not unlike Plenty's horn, and who raised, who raised it high to shed its light on Scrooge as he came peeping round the door. Come in, come in, and know me better, man. I am the ghost of Christmas present. You've never seen the likes of me before. Touch my robe. Scrooge did as he was told and held it fast. The room and its contents all vanished instantly, and they stood in the city streets on a snowy Christmas day. Scrooge and the ghost passed on invisible straight to Scrooge's clerks. And on the threshold of the door, the spirit smiled and stopped to bless his four-room house. Think of that. Bob Cratchit had but 15 bob a week himself. He pocketed on Saturdays but 15 copies of his Christian name, and yet the ghost of Christmas present blessed his four-room house. Then up rose Mrs. Cratchit, Cratchit's wife, dressed up but poorly in a twice-turned gown, but brave in ribbons which are cheap and make a goodly show for sixpence. She laid the cloth, assisted by Belinda Cratchit, second of her daughters, also brave in ribbons, while Master Peter Cratchit plunged a fork into the saucepan of potatoes and, getting the corners of his monstrous shirt collar into his mouth, rejoiced to find himself so gallantly attired. And now, two smaller Cratchits, boy and girl, came tearing in and screaming that outside the bakers they had smelt the goose and known it for their own. And basking in luxurious thoughts of sage and onion, these young Cratchits danced about the table and exalted Master Peter Cratchit to the skies, while he, not proud although his collars nearly choked him, blew the fire until the slow potatoes, bubbling up, knocked loudly at the saucepan lid to be let out and peeled. Whatever's gone into your precious father, then, said Mrs. Cratchit. And your brother, Tiny Tim, and Martha weren't as late as this last Christmas day by half an hour. Here's Martha, mother, cried the two young Cratchit. Hooray, there's such a goose, Martha. Ooh. Why, bless your heart alive, my dear. How late you are, said Mrs. Cratchit, kissing her a dozen times and taking off her shawl and bonnet for her. We'd a deal of work to finish up last night, replied the girl. Well, never mind, so long as you're come, said Mrs. Cratchit. Sit you down before the fire, my dear, and have a walk, Lord bless you. No, no, there's father coming, cried the two young Cratchits who were everywhere. Hide, Martha, hide. So Martha hid herself. And in came little Bob, the father, with at least three feet of comforter, exclusive of the fringe, hanging down before him and his threadbare clothes darned and brushed to look seasonable, and Tiny Tim upon his shoulder. Alas for Tiny Tim, he bore a little crutch and had his limbs supported by an iron frame. Why, where's our mother? cried Bob Cratchit. Not coming, said Mrs. Cratchit. Not coming, said Bob, with a sudden detention in his high spirits, for he had been Tim's blood horse all the way from the church and had come home rampant. Not coming on Christmas Day? Martha didn't like to see him disappointed, even if it were only a joke. So she came out prematurely from behind the closet door and ran into his arms, while the two young Cratchits hustled Tiny Tim and bore him off into the wash house that he might hear the pudding singing in the copper. And how did little, how did little Tim behave? Says Mrs. Cratchit after she rallied Bob on his credulity and Bob had hugged his daughter to his heart's content. How did little Tim behave? Oh, as good as gold, said Bob. And better, it's 
sometimes it gets uh, it gets so thoughtful sitting there by himself and thinks the strangest things you ever heard. He told me, coming home, that he hoped that people saw him in the church because he was a cripple and it might be pleasant for them to remember upon Christmas Day who made lame beggars walk and blind men see. Yeah. Bob's voice was tremulous as he told her this and trembled more when he said that Tiny Tim was growing strong and hearty. His active little crutch was set upon the floor, and back came Tiny Tim before another word was spoken, escorted by his brother and sister to his stool beside the fire, while Bob, turning up his cuffs as if, poor fellow, they were capable of being made more shabby, mixed uh, some gin and lemons in a jug, and stirred it round and round, and put it on the hob to sit up. Master Peter and the two ubiquitous young Cratchits went to fetch the goose, with which they soon returned, in high procession. Mrs. Cratchit made the gravy ready beforehand in a little saucepan hissing hot. Master Peter Cratchit mashed the potatoes with incredible vigor. Miss Belinda sweetened the apple sauce and Martha dusted the hot plates. Bob took Tiny Tim beside him in a tiny corner of the table and the two young Cratchits set chairs for everybody not forgetting themselves and mounting guard upon their posts crammed spoons into their mouths lest they should shriek for goose before their turn came to be helped. At last, the dishes were set on and grace was said, and it was succeeded by a breathless pause. As Mrs. Cratchit, looking slowly all along the carving knife, prepared to plunge it in the breast that when she did, and when the long-expected gush of stuffing issued forth, one murmur of delight arose all round the board, and even Tiny Tim, excited by the two young Cratchits, beat the table with the handle of his knife and feebly cried, Hooray! There never was such a goose. Bob said he didn't believe there ever was such a goose cooked. Its tenderness and flavor, size and cheapness were themes of universal admiration. Eked out by the apple sauce and mashed potatoes, it was sufficient dinner for the whole family indeed, as Mrs. Cratchit said afterwards with great delight, surveying one small atom of bone upon the table. They hadn't ate it all at last, yet everyone had had enough, and the youngest Cratchits in particular were steeped in sage and onion to the eyebrows. <laughs> but then Mrs. Cratchit left the room alone, too nervous to bear witnesses, to take the pudding up and bring it in. Suppose it should not be done enough. Supposing it should break in or turning out, suppose somebody should have got over the back wall while they were making many with the goose and stolen it. A supposition of which the two young Cratchits were living. All sorts of horror were supposed. I know a great deal of steam. The pudding was out of the copper. A smell like a washing day that was a cloth. A smell like an eating house and a pastry cook's next door to each other with a laundress's next door to that. That was the pudding. In half a minute, Mrs. Cratchit entered, flushed but smiling proudly, with the pudding like a speckled cannonball, so hard and firm, and blazing in half and half a quarter of ignited brandy, and bedight with Christmas holly stuck into the top. Oh, a wonderful, wonderful pudding. Bob Cratchit said, and calmly it's true, that he regarded it as the greatest success achieved by Mrs. Cratchit since their marriage. Mrs. Cratchit said that now the weight was off her mind, she would confess that she had her doubts about the quantity of flour. Everybody had something to say about it, but nobody said or thought that it was at all a small pudding for a very large family. Any Cratchit would have blushed to hint at such a thing. At last, the dinner was all done, the cloth was cleared, the hearth swept, and the fire made up. The compound and the jug being tasted and considered perfect. Apples and oranges were put upon the table, and a shovel full of chestnuts on the fire, and then all the Cratchit family drew round the hearth in what Bob Cratchit called a circle, and at Bob Cratchit's elbow stood the family display of glass, two tumblers, and a custard cup without a handle. These held the hot stuff from the jug, however, as well as golden goblers would have done, and Bob served it out with beaming looks. Then Bob proposed the toast. A very good 
Christmas to us all, my dear. God bless us. To which the whole family re echoed. God bless us, everyone, said Tiny to him last of all. He sat very close to his father, didn't he, upon his little stool. Bob held his withered little hand in his as if he loved the child and wished to keep him by his side and dreaded that he might be taken from him. Scrooge raised his head speedily on hearing his own name. Mr. Scrooge, said Bob Cratchit, I'll give you Mr. Scrooge, the founder of the feast. Mrs. Cratchit said, reddening, the founder of the feast? I wish I had him here. I'd give him a piece of my mind to feast upon him. I hope he had a good appetite for it. My dear, said Bob, the children, Christmas Day. It should be Christmas Day, I'm sure, she said, on which one drinks the health of such an odious, stingy, hard, unfeeling man as Mr. Scrooge. You know he is, Robert. Nobody knows it better than you do, poor fellow. My dear, said Bob, Christmas Day. Yeah. I'll drink his health for your sake of the day, she said, not for his. <clears throat> Long life to him, a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. He'll be very happy and very merry, I'm no doubt. <laughs> the children drank the toast after her. It was the first of their proceedings which had no heartiness in it. Tiny Tim drank it last of all, but he didn't care tuppence for it. Scrooge was the owner of the family. The mention of his name cast a dark shadow on the party, which was not dispelled for full five minutes. After it had passed away, they were ten times merrier than before, from the mere relief of Scrooge the Baleful being done with. Bob Cratchit told them how he had a situation in his eyes for Master Peter which would bring in, if procured, a full five and sixpence weekly. The two young Cratchits laughed tremendously at the idea of Peter as being a man of business, and Peter himself looked thoughtfully at the fire from between his collars, as if he were deliberating what particular investment he should favour when he came into the receipt of that boo-boo-boo income. All the time, the chestnuts in the jug went round and round, and by and by they had a song about a lost child travelling in the snow from Tiny Tim, who had a plaintive little voice, but sang it very well indeed. There was nothing of high mark in this. They were not a handsome family. They were not well dressed. Their shoes were far from waterproof, and their clothes were scanty, as Peter might have known and very likely did be inside of a pawnbroker's. But they were happy, grateful, pleased with one another and contented with the time. And when they faded and looked happier yet in the bright sprinklings of the spirit's torch and party, Scrooge had his eyes upon them, and especially on Tiny Tim, until the last. It was a great surprise to Scrooge, as this scene vanished, to hear a hearty laugh. It was a greater surprise to Scrooge to recognize it as his own memories, and to find himself in a bright, gleaming room with the spirit standing smiling by his side, and looking at that same nephew, Fred. It is a fair, even-handed, noble adjustment of things, and while there is in infection, disease, and sorrow, there is nothing in the world so irresistibly contagious as laughter and good humour. When Scrooge's nephew laughed, Scrooge's niece by marriage laughed as heartily as he did, and their assembled friends, being not a bit behind, had laughed out too, very lustily. Fred said, he said that Christmas was a humbug, as I did. He believed it too. More shame by him, Fred, said the sister. She was very pretty, exceedingly pretty, with a dimpled, surprised-looking capital face, a ripe little mouth that seemed made to be kissed, as no doubt it was. All kinds of good little dots about her chin that melted into one another when she laughed, and the sunniest pair of eyes you ever saw in any little creature's head. Altogether, she was what we would call provoking, but satisfactory, or perfectly satisfactory. <laughs> Fred said, he's a comedy old fellow, and that's the truth, and not so pleasant as he might be, however, his offences carry their own punishment, and I've nothing to say against him. Who suffers by his ill wins? Himself always. Here he takes it into his head and it's like us, and he won't come to dine with us. What's the consequence? He shouldn't miss much of a dinner. Indeed, I think he misses a very good dinner, interrupted Scrooge's niece. Everybody else said the same, and they must be allowed to be competent judges because they just had the dinner. And with the dessert upon the table were clustered round the fire by lamplight. Well, I'm very glad to hear it, said Fred, because I haven't any great faith in these young housekeepers. What do you say, Topper? Topper clearly had his eye on one of 
of school to his niece's sisters. For he answered that a bachelor was a wretched outcast who had no right to express an opinion on the subject. Whereas Scrooge's niece's sister, the plump one with the lace tucker, not the one with the roses, laughed. Not a child. There was first a game of blind man's buff, though, and I no more believe that Topper was really blinded than I believe he had eyes in his boots, because the way in which he went after that plump sister in the lace tucker was an outrage on the credulity of human nature. <laughs> Knocking down the fire lines, tumbling over the chairs, bumping up against the piano, smothering himself among the curtains, wherever she went, there went he. He always knew where the plump sister was. He wouldn't catch anybody else. If you'd fallen up against him, as some of them did, and stood there, he would have made a feint of endeavouring to see you, which would have been an affront to your understanding, and would instantly have sidled off in the direction of the plump sister. Here's a new game. It was a game called Yes and No, where Scrooge's nephew had to think of something and the rest must find out what, he only answering yes or no, as the case may be. The fire of questioning to which Fred was exposed elicited from him that he was thinking of an animal, a live animal, rather a disagreeable animal, a savage animal, an animal that growled and grunted sometimes and talked sometimes and lived in London and walked about the streets and wasn't made a show of and wasn't led by anybody and wasn't a horse or an ass or a cow or a bull or a tiger or a dog or a pig or a cat or a bear. And every new question put to him, Fred burst into a fresh roar of laughter and was so inexpressibly tickled that he was obliged to get up off the sofa and stamp his feet. At last, the pump sister cried out, I found out, I know what it is, Fred, I know what it is. What is it, said Fred? It's your Uncle Scrooge. Yes. Which he certainly was. <laughs> Admiration was the universal sentiment. Though some objected that the reply to is it a bear ought to have been yes. <laughs> Uncle Scrooge had imperceptibly become so light of heart that he would have drunk to the unconscious company in a speech, but the whole scene passed off in the breath of the last word spoken by his nephew, and he and the spirit were again upon their travels. Much they saw, and far they went, and many homes they visited but always with a happy end. The spirits stood beside sick beds and they were cheerful, on foreign lands and they were close at home, by struggling men and they were patient in their greater hope, by poverty and it was rich. In almshouse, <coughs> hospital and jail, in misery's every refuge where vain man in his little brief authority has not made fast the door and bar the spirit out, he left his blessing and taught Scrooge his precepts. Suddenly, as they stood together in an open place, the bell struck twelve. Scrooge looked about him for a first and saw it no more. And as the last stroke ceased to vibrate, he remembered the prediction of old Jacob Marley. And lifting up his eyes, beheld a solemn phantom, draped and hooded, coming like a mist along the ground. The phantom slowly, gravely, silently approached. When it came near him, Scrooge went down upon his knees, for in the air through which this spirit moved, it seemed to scatter gloom and mystery. It was shrouded in a deep black garment which concealed its head, its face, its form, and left nothing of it visible save one outstretched hand. He knew no more for the spirit neither spoke nor moved. And Scrooge said, I am in this presence of the ghost of Christmas yet to come. Ghost of the future, I fear you more than any specter I have seen. But as I know your purpose is to do me good, and as I hope to live to be another man from what I was, I am prepared to hear to bear you company and to do it with a thankful heart. Will you not speak to me? It gave him no reply, but the hand pointed straight ahead. Lead on, lead on, the night is waning fast and it is precious time for me, I know. Lead on, spirit. 
They scarcely seemed to enter the city, for the city seemed rather to spring up about them, but there they were in the heart of it, on change, among the merchants. The spirit stopped beside one little knot of business there, and observing that the hand was pointing to them, Scrooge advanced to listen to their talk. No, said a great fat man with an enormous chin. I don't know much about it either way. I only know he's dead. What's he done with his money? asked the red-faced gentleman. I have heard, said the man with a large chin. Call me, perhaps he hasn't left it to me, that's all I know. Bye bye then, ha ha. They left this busy scene and went into an obscure part of the town, to a low shop where iron and old rags, bottles, bones, and greasy offal were bought by a grey-haired old rascal of great age who sat there smoking a pipe. Scrooge and the Phantom came into the presence of this man just as a woman with a heavy bundle slunk into the shop. But she had scarcely entered when another woman, similarly then, came in too, and she was closely followed by a man in faded black. After a short period of blank astonishment, at which the old man with the pipe then joined in, they all three burst into a laugh. She who had entered first said, Let that charwoman alone to be first, and let the laundress alone to be the second, and let the undertaker's man alone to be the third. Joe said, What have you got to sell? What have you got to sell? Half a minute's patience, Joe, and you shall see. Every person has a right to take care of themselves. He always did. Who is the worst for the loss of a few things like these? Not a dead man, I hope. Ha uh ha! -huh. Open up that bundle, Joe, and see for yourself. Joe went down upon his knees for the greater convenience of opening the bundle and dragged out a large and heavy roll of some dark stuff. Here, what do you call these bed curtains? Ah, bed curtains. Don't drop the oil upon the blankets now. These blankets. Whose else's do you think? He isn't likely to take cold without them, I dare say, eh? <laughs> you may look through that shirt till your eyes ache, but you won't find a hole in it, nor a threadbare place. It's the best he had, and a fine one, too, and they'd have wasted it by dressing him up in it if it hadn't been for me. Scrooge, listen to this dialogue in horror. He said, Spirit, I, I see, I see. But the case of this unhappy man might be my own. My life tends that way. Merciful heavens, what is this? The scene had changed. But now he almost touched a bare, uncurtained bed. A pale light rising in the outer air fell straight upon this bed, and on it, unwatched, unwept, uncared for, was the body of this plundered man unknown. Scrooge said, The spirit, let me see some tenderness connected with a death, or this dark chamber spirit will be forever present to me. And the ghost conducted him to poor Bob Cratchit's house, the dwelling he had visited before, and found the mother and the children seated round the fire. Quiet. Very quiet. The noisy little Cratchits were as still as statue in one corner, and sat looking up at Peter, who had a book before him. The mother and her daughters were engaged in needlework, but surely they were very and he took a child and set him in the midst of them. Where had Scrooge heard those words? He had not dreamed them. The boy must have read them out as he and the spirit crossed the threshold. Why didn't he go on? The mother laid her work on the table and put her hand to her face. She said, the color hurts my eyes. The color. She said, they're better again now. It makes them weak by candlelight, and I wouldn't show weak eyes to your father when he comes home from the work. And there he is. It must be near his time. Past it, rather, said Peter. But I think he's walked a little slower than he used to these last few evenings, mother. And she said, I've known him. I've known him walk with Tiny Tim upon his shoulder very fast indeed. But he 
was very light to carry and his father loved him so it was no trouble, no trouble. There he is. She hurried out to meet him. And little Bob in his comforter, he had need of it, poor fellow, came in. His tea was ready for him on the hob, and they all tried which would help him to it most. Then the two young Cratchits got upon his knees and laid each child a little cheek against his face as if they said, don't mind it, father. Don't be grieved. Bob was very cheerful with them, and he spoke pleasantly to all the family. He looked at the work upon the table and praised the industry and speed of Mrs. Cratchit and the girls. They'd be done long before Sunday, he said. And she said, Sunday, you went again today then, Robert? Yes, my dear. I wish you could have gone. It would have done you good to see how green the place is. And but you'll see it often. I promise you now. I promise I will walk there on a... Oh, my little, little child. My little child. And poor Bob broke down all at once. He couldn't help it. If he could have helped it, he and his child would have been farther apart than perhaps they were. And Scrooge said, Spectre, something informs me that our parting moment is at hand. I know it, but I know not how. Tell me what man that was with the covered face when we saw lying dead. The ghost of Christmas yet to come conveyed him to a dismal, wretched, ruinous churchyard. The spirit stood among the graves and pointed down at one. Scrooge said, before I draw near to that stone, to which you point answer me one question. Are these the shadows of the things that will be, or are they the shadows of the things that may be only? Still, the ghost pointed downwards towards the grave by which he stood. The spirit was immovable, and Scrooge crept slowly towards the grave, trembling as he went. And following the finger, read upon the stone of the neglected grave his own name, Ebenezer Scrooge. Oh, am I, am I the man that lay upon that bed? Oh, no, spirit, no, no, hear me. I'm not the man I was. I will not be the man that I must have been but for this. Why show me this and I am past all hope? Assure me that I may yet change these shadows that you have shown me by an altered life. For the first time, the kind hand faltered, and Scrooge said, I will honor Christmas in my heart, and try to keep it all the year. I will live in the past, the present, and the future. The spirits of all three shall strive within me. I will not shut out the lesson they teach. Tell me I may sponge away the writing on this stone. Holding up his hands in one last prayer to have his faith reversed, he saw an alteration in the phantom's hood and dress. It shrunk and collapsed and dwindled down into a bedpost. Yes, and the bedpost was his own. And the bed was his own. And the room was his own. But best of all, and happiest of all, the time before him was his own to make amends in. He was checked in his transports by the churches ringing out the lustiest peals he had ever heard. Running to a window, he opened it and put out his head. No fog, no mist, no light. Clear, bright, stirring, golden day. What's today? cried Scrooge, calling down to a boy in Sunday clothes who perhaps had loitered in there to look about him. Hey, what's today, my fine fellow? Today? Why, it's Christmas Day. Oh, it's Christmas Day. I haven't missed it. Hello, my fine fellow. Do you know the poachers in the next street but one at the corner? I should hope I do, said the boy. An intelligent boy. Oh, remarkable boy. Do you know whether they've sold that prize turkey that was hanging up there? Not the little prize turkey, the big prize turkey. What? The one as big as me? That's what a delightful boy. It's a pleasure to talk to <laughs> Yes, my buck. Yes, yeah, said the boy. It's hanging up there now. He says, go and buy it. No, no, I'm in earnest. Go and buy it and tell them to bring it here, that I may give them direction where to take it. Come back with a man and I'll give you a shilling. Come back in less than five minutes.
language, and I'll give you half a crown. Ha! The boy was off like a shot. <laughs> Screw said, I'll send it to Bob Cratchit. He shot the who said it's the size of tiny tin. Ha! The hand in which he wrote the address was not a steady one, but write it he did somehow, and went downstairs to open the street door ready for the coming of a poulterer's man. It was a turkey. <laughs> he never could have stood upon his legs that bird. He would have snapped them off short in a minute, like sticks of sealing wax. <laughs> Scrooge dressed himself all in his best, and at last got out into the streets. The people were less time pouring forth as he had seen them, the ghost of Christmas present, and walking with his hands behind him. Scrooge regarded everyone with a delighted smile, and he looked so irresistibly pleasant in a word. The three or four good humored fellows said, Good morning, sir. Happy Christmas to you. And Scrooge said afterwards, But of all the blithe words that he had ever heard, those were the blithest in his life. In the afternoon, he turned his steps towards his nephew's house. He passed the door a dozen times before he had the courage to go up and knock, but he made a dash for it and did it. Oh, why bless my soul, cried Fred, who's this? It's I, your Uncle Scrooge. I've come to dinner. Will you let me in, Fred? Let him in? Oh. It was a mess he didn't shake his arm off. He was at home in five minutes. Nothing could have been hot here. His niece looked just the same, so did Topper when he came. So did the plump sister when she came. So did everybody when they came. Oh, wonderful party, wonderful games, wonderful unanimity, wonderful happiness. But Scrooge was early at the office next morning. Oh, he was early there. If he could only get there first and catch Bob Cratchit coming late. Ah, that was the thing he set his heart on. And he did it. The clock struck nine. No Bob. A quarter past. No Bob. Bob was full eighteen and a half minutes behind his time. His hat was off before he opened the door, his comforter too. He was on his stool in a jiffy, driving away with his pen as if he were trying to overtake nine o'clock. Hello. What do you mean by coming here at this time of day? I'm very sorry, sir. Um, I am behind my time. Yes, you are. I should think you are. Step this way, if you please. It's only once a year, sir. Um, it shall not be repeated. I was making rather merry yesterday, sir. Now, I'll tell you what, my friend. I'm not going to stand this sort of thing any longer. And therefore, Scrooge continued leaping from his stool and giving Bob such a dig in the waistcoat that he staggered back into the tank again. And therefore, I'm going to raise your salary. <laughs> Bob. And got a little nearer to the ruler. <laughs> Scrooge said, A Merry Christmas, Bob. A Merry Christmas, Bob, my good fellow, and I give you for many a year. I raise your salary and endeavor to assist your struggling family, and we discuss your affairs this very afternoon over a Christmas bowl of smoking bishop, Bob. Make up the fire. <laughs> and buy a second coal scuffle before you dot another eye, Bob. Scrooge was better than his word. He did it all, and infinitely more. And to Tiny Tim, who did not die, he became a second father. He became as good a friend, as good a master, and as good a man as the good old city knew, or any other good old city, town, or borough in the good old world. Some people laugh to see the operation in him, but his own heart laughed. And that was quite enough for him. He had no further intercourse with spirits, but lived in that respect upon a total abstinence principle ever afterwards. And it was always said of him that he knew how to keep Christmas well if any man alive possessed the knowledge. Oh, may that be truly said of us and of all of us. And so, as Tiny Tim observed, God bless us. Everyone. <laughs>
tendency in old age actually to talk in song titles. <laughs> So uh, I still want to see you in a few minutes. I'm just going to change the brush my tooth. See you. <laughs>